Okay. Frank, thank you very much. So one of the joys of playing cleanup batter is that you get to pay for the sins of all your colleagues and not keeping to time. But on the other hand, all their stuff is so fascinating that I think it's okay. Um, so I'm going to try to keep this as short as possible. And what I'm going to tell you about is the prospect of actually measuring in detail the composition of the atmospheres of extrasolar planets and how that relates to observations that we make in our own solar system. But I'm not going to do that for terrestrial planets because I'm going to argue that even for the next generation of space telescope, it's going to be very hard. I'm going to talk about what we can learn by doing high quality spectra of giant planets and how that relates to the chemical evidence for solar system formation uh, in our own outer solar system. So uh, let me begin by just telling you a little bit of how the transit spectroscopy technique works. And you've heard mention of this in, uh, by the previous two speakers. So the transit technique for detecting and characterizing planets is actually the simplest technique conceptually. And it's essentially that a planet, if it's in an orbit that uh, is aligned, the orbit plane is aligned with you, the observer, uh, will pass in front of and behind its parent star. And as it passes in front of the star, the light of the star dims a little bit, as you can see in this. And then because the planet is illuminated by the star, as it moves around to the other side of its orbit, that illumination slightly increases the total illumination that you see in the system. And when the planet passes behind the star, that excess illumination is lost, so you get a secondary transit. In all of this, it's important to remember that we cannot directly separate the light of the planet from the star. That can only be done for planets that are in widely spaced orbits, and at least today only for planets that are quite uh, large and luminous. So this is the only way to do this for small or close-in planets. Something, by the way, that Giordano Bruno realized about 415 years ago but he got no funding for it, so even worse. Um, the transit technique, uh, you know, Charbonneau and colleagues uh, first really uh, used this on extrasolar planets, but it's something that you can do with a small telescope. And uh, this is an example of a transit that was done uh, by my Astro 3301 class, which is an exoplanets class at Cornell, with the help of Don Barry, who is the observatory manager at um, a small observatory a few miles from Cornell. And it involves some careful work and then one miracle. The careful work is that you have, uh, you're observing several stars at once with several cameras. This is the brightness of the star right here. And this is uh, the time over here. I knew that was going to happen. This is the time over here. And you can see uh, the light of the star beginning to decrease at just the right point that's predicted. We didn't discover this planet. This was discovered by others. And we just went to observe as it moves in front of its parent star. We could see the light of the star begin to dim. The miracle, of course, is that there was a clear sky in Ithaca, New York. And we could actually see this happen. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, by the time uh, the planet was ready to move away from the limb of the star, the star was close to the horizon and we could not get useful photometric data. So we only got the ingress, but in two years of doing this, I've gotten one ingress and one egress from different planets, but I can put them together and say we've done you know, one extrasolar planet transit. Uh, but you can do this with small telescopes, which is remarkable. Now, the other important thing about planetary transits is that it tells you something that makes even more valuable the primary technique that is used for measuring the masses of extrasolar planets. That principal technique, which was developed uh, in the United States by Jeff Marcy and his colleagues, and in Europe by Michel Mayor and his colleagues, is to observe the radial motion of the star as it's, uh, it and its planet are in orbit around their common uh, center of mass. Okay, Remember, planet doesn't orbit around the star. Planet and the star orbit around their common barycenter. Okay, So the star is, is making these little orbits around the system center of mass, a barycentric wobble. Uh, 
And so if uh, any component of that motion is toward or away from you is radial, then it's possible to measure uh, through the Doppler shift of spectral lines in the star spectrum the effect of the planet. And that effect depends on the mass of the planet relative to the mass of the star. However, if that system is face on, like this, so that the star is executing a motion against the plane of the sky, there's no signal at all. If the orbit plane of the planet and the star is aligned with you, uh, you're the observer, then you get the full component of the radial motion and you get the full mass. In general, systems will be oriented uh, in neither of those two extremes. And what is measured in the radial velocity technique is then um, essentially the lower limit to the mass of the planet. But if the planet is transiting its star, as you see in the upper left, then you know that the orbit plane is nearly aligned with you, the observer. And that means that the mass that you derive from the radial velocity uh, uh, of the star, from the Doppler shift in the star's stellar line, that mass is the mass of the planet, and not the mass of the planet times the sine of the inclination. So immediately from transiting planets, if one can get radial velocity, one can get the mass and the radius, and therefore the density. Um, for massive planets, of course, uh, one has to work out the equation of state of the material uh, in order to determine the composition. It's not merely the mass divided by the, the volume of the body. And so you see mass-radius relationships here on the right-hand side. Uh, Sarah Seeger and colleagues and Sasoloff and others have pioneered this sort of work. And this is extremely valuable. You can find out whether you have a gas giant or a water world or an iron world or whatever. But this is not all the information you need to understand planets. After all, we only have to go to our own solar system and look at <coughs> Venus and the Earth and know that the mass-radius relationship is not enough. These two planets, if they were in orbit around a star 10 parsecs away, uh, and they were you know, in a system that transited, they would look identical from the mass-radius relationship point of view, right? They're the same mass, and they have roughly the same radius. And yet, these are two planets that could not be more different from each other in terms of their history. So knowing the mass and the radius doesn't tell us about the history and the habitability of worlds around other stars. We have to have compositional information. And that compositional information comes from spectra, and particularly from principally atmospheric spectra. So uh, this is a, a very old slide, borrowed 20,000 times. I don't even know who it started with. But uh, it essentially illustrates the two types of uh, spectra that one can get from transiting exoplanets. Let me start with a secondary eclipse, which is the one over here. And this is the part of the orbit where the planet uh, is being illuminated by the parent star. And you make a spectrum of that system. Remember, you cannot separate the star and the planet. So you get a spectrum of the star and the illuminated planet. And in the thermal infrared, it may be the thermal emission from the planet. Then you wait a little bit, and the planet passes behind the star. And you make another spectrum, and it's just the spectrum of the star. And so now you can separate the two. And you have the spectrum of the planet as a consequence. And this has been done uh, using Hubble Space Telescope data. The primary eclipse, or the primary transit over here, one can actually get a spectrum, even though the planet is dark, if the planet has a substantial atmosphere because the amount of dimming of the starlight <clears throat> depends upon the ratio of the planet's area to the star's area. And as a function of wavelength, the planet's atmosphere will be more or less opaque. Where the planet's atmosphere is opaque, the planet seems to block more of the light of the star. And so you get a deeper transit. And where the planet, uh, at the wavelengths where the planet's atmosphere is more transparent, the planet looks smaller. And so that, in effect, gives you uh, a transit spectrum. And that was first worked out uh, independently by Sarah Seeger and colleagues and uh, Adam Burroughs and colleagues back a long time ago. OK, so this has been done. Um, and it's been done uh, 
with Hubble Space Telescope with Spitzer. This is one example uh, from a paper by uh, Laura Kreidberg and colleagues. Uh, we see on the top uh, a, um, a set of models uh, for the abundance of, uh, of water and other things in the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet, GJ1214, which I believe is a Neptune-sized body. The blow-up at the bottom shows you uh, in detail the data. You can see the data in the error bars. Uh, this is a you know, really good uh, spectrum, but it's limited by the size of Hubble Space Telescope and the difficulty of getting this type of data uh, from these uh, planets that are relatively faint. So uh, you can diagnose something about the composition, but the error bars are still rather large. And so to make real progress in getting spectra of, of let alone giant planets, uh, and of course it's even more difficult for terrestrial planets, we have to go to larger systems. So the James Webb Space Telescope uh, is uh, going to be the next revolution in space-based astronomy. Uh, it is a telescope with a much larger mirror than Hubble Space Telescope. It's a multiple mirror, segmented mirror, about six and a half meters across. That means that it collects more light than Hubble does and is therefore more sensitive. What also makes James Webb uh, a, 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 a step forward, a huge leap forward, is that its wavelength coverage is much, much larger. Hubble basically went out uh, to a micron with, uh, for a short time it had a near-infrared instrument that went out to a few microns. James Webb will go out to the middle part of the infrared, and to do that, it must be kept very, very cold. So Webb has this enormous sun shield the size of a tennis court on it. Uh, it will be put not in low Earth orbit, which is a very warm environment, but at the Lagrange 2 point, about three times uh, the uh, Earth-Moon distance uh, from the Earth where, where, where it will sit. And it has a mechanical cryocooler to further cool down the instruments. So as a result of this, it's extraordinarily sensitive, and the instruments uh, are designed to take advantage of that. This is a plot of the, uh, essentially the flux that can be detected on the y-axis versus the wavelength out to about 25 microns. Three of the four James Webb instruments are shown in red. Other facilities are shown in other colors. And if you pay attention to the fact that this is a logarithmic plot, you can see that Webb is orders of magnitude more sensitive than anything we have today on the ground and also what we have in space. There's another plot that shows this relative to Hubble that I won't show here. Uh, and we have um, the PI for one of the instruments in the audience, the US team lead for another instrument in the audience. This has been a, an enormous effort to get this incredibly complex and very, very sensitive machine to the point where it can be launched. And uh, you're still four years away from that, right, Marsha? So when it happens, it'll be a revolution. And let me talk a little bit about what it can do uh, in the last part of my talk, which is the application. So I'd love to be the person who measures the spectra of an extrasolar Earth and discovers that it has oxygen and be misled, as John Grotzinger said, to think that there was life. By the way, it was not Robin who first thought that up. It goes much farther back than that. But I actually, for the little amount of James Webb time that I have, I don't want to spend thousands of hours integrating on a tiny planet. I want to look at a lot of giant planets, and I want to understand the carbon to oxygen ratios in those systems by measuring the compositions of those atmospheres. So I'll explain why. Carbon and oxygen are the two most abundant elements in the universe after hydrogen and helium. Their relative abundances in the solar system, uh, in the sun, about 0.55. This number has gone up and down over time. It's surprisingly difficult to get that number for the sun. Um, but their relative abundances are close enough to each other that um, some variation in that number on the order of 10 or 20 percent will determine whether, in fact, there is water available in any given planetary system. And that's a very curious and interesting coincidence that uh, is important for understanding the habitability of planets. So the habitable zone is the place around any star where liquid water is stable by dint of the amount of sunlight that the planet receives from its star. But when is a planet in the habitable zone not habitable? Well, the answer to that is when there's no water on the planet, because water is what's required for life. So 
the concern is <clears throat> that water may be one of the most variable molecules in protoplanetary disks, and it's tied to the carbon to oxygen ratio. And furthermore, it has to be delivered to terrestrial planets in the habitable zone, because one of the unfortunate uh, facts of nature that seem to come out of studies of protoplanetary disks is that the position where a planet is habitable after it's formed and the disk goes away is a position where the disk is actually too hot during the planet formation era to allow water to condense locally in that environment. So water always has to be delivered remotely from asteroids, comets, et cetera. So the carbon to oxygen ratio in a system will determine how much water is there uh, and uh, will determine how much is present uh, in condensed form beyond the condensation front, what's called the snow line. And so in systems that are sufficiently carbon rich, as first pointed out by um, a number of people, um, Sarah Seeger, uh, Mark Kutchner, and uh, Jade Bond, uh, the reservoir material beyond the snow line will be dry and very little water will be delivered to the habitable zone. That's the fact. Okay, so why is this the case? Well, you only have to count atoms. Um, you have a, a, a given fixed carbon-oxygen ratio. Uh, oxygen will be soaked up by magnesium, silicon, iron. You count up how much that is in solar abundance. It's a lot. And what you're left with is available not necessarily to make water, because if the protoplanetary disk has a typical temperature pressure profile, carbon monoxide will be preferred relative to methane. And that carbon will soak up the oxygen. And if the carbon to oxygen ratio in bulk is only 15% higher than it is in our system, there will be virtually no water. And there will be no life. Now, um, work by Jeff Marcy and colleagues and others have suggested that the solar system may be a little bit unusual in having a low carbon to oxygen ratio. The average carbon to oxygen ratio, from an elemental point of view, in our galactic neighborhood may actually be a little bit higher than 0.55. And so, habitable planets may be rare from that point of view. So one way to figure all this out is to look at these planets. Um, you know, these are measurements of stars. We want to look and see what's in the planets. The giant planets have the largest reservoir of carbon and oxygen. And if we take spectra of hot Jupiters, which are the ones that are orbiting close to their parent stars, then um, all the major molecules that contain carbon and oxygen will be available for view spectroscopically. And this is a simulation by Tom Green at NASA Ames of a spectrum, uh, transit spectrum, by James Webb Space Telescope of a Jupiter-sized planet. And these data, which are high-quality spectra, can be obtained in one transit. Uh, so one can do this for dozens of extrasolar giant planets and try to map out systematics, the C to O ratio between the planets and the stars. For our own solar system, determining the carbon to oxygen ratio in Jupiter has been a very frustrating uh, and still unsolved problem. The Galileo probe entered the atmosphere of Jupiter in the mid-90s. It measured elemental abundances with a mass spectrometer. You can see here the carbon abundance in ratio to solar is about five times solar, as are most of the other elements shown here, except for oxygen. The oxygen number is low. And that number comes from mass spectrometry data, which are shown here. This is water mixing ratio versus atmospheric pressure in bars. Two measurements at 11 bars and at about 20 bars. And you see the water abundance going up from 11 bars to 20 bars, which is a sure indication that the water abundance that the Galileo probe measured was affected by meteorology, and not directly by clouds because it fell into a dry region, but that region was the subsidence zone where um, dry air was being dragged downward to large pressures. And so from Galileo, we did not get a measure of the Jovian water abundance. And so we have to do this over again. And we will in two years, not from a probe, but remotely from a spacecraft in orbit around Jupiter called Juno. Juno carries the first microwave radiometer to the giant planets. This shows you the weighting functions where the different wavelengths of the microwave radiometer are sensitive. And the last wavelength of 50 centimeters is sensitive to pressures uh, from 30 to uh, up to 100 bars. And that's deep enough to detect water. So we hope 
from the Juno mission to be able finally to measure the water abundance in the one giant planet that we know the most about, and that's Jupiter. Now this won't tell us the carbon oxygen abundance, unfortunately, in total in the protoplanetary disk because it's some mixture of gas and planetesimals. So we still need to measure uh, densities of primitive bodies in the solar system to give us some clue as to the ice to rock ratio, which indirectly tells us again about the carbon oxygen abundance. And this is one example of a measurement that was done. Uh, this object, Phoebe, is a moon of Saturn. It orbits about 1.2 million kilometers away from Saturn in a retrograde orbit. So it's very evidently captured. And it gives every indication of being what's called a centaur, a body that was in the Kuiper belt, perturbed inward, and was in this case captured by Saturn. So we have the first spectra and density measurements of what may be a Kuiper belt object before Pluto Express does. And the density of this, in short, is um, what we would expect for a body that was formed in a solar nebula that had carbon monoxide as its dominant carbon bearing species and a solar carbon to oxygen ratio, just like what's in the sun. Um, we see no evidence of, um, of differences in carbon to oxygen abundance. Uh, and it's very similar to that of Pluto and Triton. So this gives us some confidence that our own system really has this ratio that we've measured in the sun, that it's about 0.55. But we still have to do measurements on more objects like this because we don't really know if Phoebe truly was a Kuiper belt object. And finally, ultimately, to be able to get the carbon to oxygen ratio in total in a protoplanetary disk, we need to measure a protoplanetary disk. And while that can be done today, James Webb will do a much more sensitive job, and it will do it in a spatially resolved way. Um, I'm looking with a group uh, in Besançon, France. Uh, this is Mohamed Ali Dib, who's a graduate student, at chemical indicators of the total carbon oxygen ratio, which we can measure in addition to carbon monoxide and water and so on. And some of those indicators may involve molecules of titanium and vanadium that uh, we can measure uh, in the optical and near infrared at very high temperature in the inner parts of the disk. Uh, their abundances or their abundance ratios based on these calculations are very, very sensitive to the C to O ratio in the gas. And so that's one thing we plan to do with James Webb. So I can't tell you more than that in the space of 20 minutes. Right, so I picked one problem. It's a problem that can only be done with James Webb in combination with solar system spacecraft. It's not gonna save our life on Earth and I'm not gonna use the trite expression that it will make life on Earth worthwhile, but it's an interesting problem and it tells us something about the typicality or the atypicality of our particular solar system and whether in fact habitable worlds really are to be expected elsewhere in our galactic neighborhood. Thank you.